Madam Speaker, Nosibwe Mapisa Ngagula, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, His Excellency Deputy President Paul Mashatile, Cabinet colleagues, members of the Executive Committee for Finance, Honorable Members, the Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, the Commissioner of the South African Revenue Services, fellow South Africans. Madam Speaker, according to two prominent economists, Alberto Alsenia and Danny Rodriguez, they had this observation to say, and I quote, a crude distinction between economics and politics would be that economics is concerned with expanding the pie, while politics is about distributing it. The point, Madam Speaker, is that the size and quality of the national pie is what informs and ultimately determines the realization of the political imperative of redistribution. Our mission over the past 30 years has been to restore both social and economic justice for our nation and to decisively address the inequality that was the hallmark of the system of discrimination and dispossession. The budgets we have tabled since 1994 have been about securing the goal of growing the economy so that we can do more to address the inequalities and deprivation that still scar our society and undermine the promise of democracy. So it is with, it is with a great sense of privilege and purpose that I stand before you to present the last budget of the Sixth Democratic Administration. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I therefore table the following documents before this House. The 24 Division of Revenue Bill, the 2024 Appropriation Bill, the Estimates of National Expenditure, the 2024 Budget Review, the 2024 Fiscal Framework, the Second Adjustment Appropriation Bill, the Budget Speech, the Gold and Foreign Exchange Contingency Reserve Account Defrayal Amendment Bill. Allow me to begin, Madam Speaker, with the global outlook. Global growth is forecast to increase from 3.1 percent this year to 3.2 in 2025. The moderate improvement is due to growth in the United States and several large economies. Huh? Downside risks from potential spikes in the global oil price if the conflict in the Middle East escalates. And if growth falters in China, the country's largest trading partner. Despite improved global outlook for 2024, South Africa's near term growth remains hamstrung by lower commodity prices and structural constraints. We estimate real GDP growth of comma 6% in 2023. This is down from comma 8% growth estimated during the medium term budget policy statement. The revision is due to weaker than expected outcomes in the third quarter of 2023, particularly in household consumption and fixed investment. Between 2024 and 2026, growth is projected to average 1.1%. The growth outlook is supported by the expected easing of power cuts as new energy projects begin production and as lower inflation supports household consumption and credit extension. 
but there are also risks to the domestic outlook. These include persistent constraints in electricity supply, freight rail and ports, and higher sovereign credit rates. Our current honourable members is that the size of the pie is not growing fast enough to meet our developmental needs. As such, our fiscal strategy to support economic growth reduce risks to the economy while ensuring fiscal sustainability. Compared to a year ago, the budget deficit for 2023-24 is estimated to worsen from 4% to 4.9% of GDP. The higher budget deficit means that debt service costs in 2023-24 have been revised higher by 15.7 billion to 356 billion. Debt service costs will absorb more than 20% of revenue. To put this into perspective, spending on debt service costs is greater than the respective budgets of social protection, health, or peace and security. For this reason, all right, members, we are strengthening our strategy and sticking to our fiscal goals. A net redu reduction of 80.6 billion in non-interest expenditure is being implemented over the medium term. At the same time, revenue has been revised up by 45.6 billion over the medium term, relative to the medium term budget policy statement. And we have taken the decision to introduce a reform of the Gold and Foreign Exchange Contingency Reserve Account, also known as GFECRA. Taken together, even with the spending increases I will announce later, the national grow government gross borrowing requirement will decline from 457.7 billion in 2024 to 428.5 billion in 2026 27. The deficit will begin to improve from 24-24 to an estimated 4.5% of GDP, reaching 3.3% by 26-27. Debt will now peak at 75.3% of GDP in 25-26. All of this puts us in a position to continue to protect core services. It allows 60% of non-interest spending to be directed to the social wage. It allows us to preserve capital spending. Compared to the medium-term budget policy statement, we are adding 57.6 billion to pay for the salaries of teachers, nurses, doctors, among many other critical services. <laughs> Madam Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, in this budget, we are announcing a reform of the GFAGRA. GFAGRA is an account held at the Reserve Bank that captures gains and losses on the country's foreign currency reserve transactions. Simply put, if the rand strengthens against the US dollar and other reserve currencies, the account balance declines, and vice versa. The account balance has grown to over 500 billion over the years because the rand has depreciated over time. A new settlement arrangement is being introduced that will reduce government borrowing and improve the Reserve Bank's equity position. Ultimately, we are bringing South Africa closer to our peers and ensuring alignment to international best practices. We will draw down 150 billion rand of the GFECRA balance once we have ensured that the sufficient buffers are available to absorb exchange rate swings and the solvency of the Reserve Bank is not compromised. We have embarked on a broad structural reform agenda that aims to address the challenges that held back our growth. This agenda included areas like electricity, logistics, water, telecommunication, and visa reforms. The budget review details the good progress that has been made in these areas over the past few years, but obstacles remain. And let me focus on the two largest of these. Load shedding is a problem that confronts all South Africans. It disrupts production, operations, livelihoods, Reforming the sector will result in long-term energy security. 
We took the necessary decision in the past five years, and these are beginning to uh, are bearing fruit. <laughs> to, to promote further investment in renewables, this budget proposes an increase in, in the limit for renewable energy projects that can qualify for carbon offset regime from 50 megawatts to 30 megawatts. ESCOM continues to be a key role player in the electricity sector, and the debt relief plan allows the entity to focus on its core business. We will, realize the, uh, will release the report on the independent review of, of scam coal-fired power stations in the coming week. The review was done to inform part of the conditions attached to the debt relief plan. The recommendations will fit into ESCOM's corporate plans to bolster accountability and oversight. It is true the combination of private investment in new energy projects, rooftop solar installations, and improvements in ESCOM generation fleet that load shedding will reduce, and reliability and security of supply improve. In addition, to support these efforts, we were introducing a new two billion conditional grant over the medium term to fund the rollout of smart prepaid meters. This will begin with the municipalities that have been approved for debt relief. To address South Africa's increasingly unreliable logistics system, Cabinet approved the freight logistic roadmap in December 2023. The roadmap outlines immediate steps needed to improve port equipment, locomotive availability, and network security. It also sets out a clear path for enhancing efficiencies, facilitating the introduction of competition, and leveraging financial and technical support of the private sector. In this regard, Third-party access to the freight rail network will be introduced by May 2024. In ports, private partner has been secured to upgrade Pier 2 of the Durban Container Terminal. This should increase private investment in equipment, enhance technological capability, and improve operational efficiencies. Government has provided Transnet with a 47 billion guarantee facility to support the NTT is recovery plan and meets its immediate debt obligation. Like ESCOM, the guarantees come with conditions. These conditions require Transnet to focus on the ESCO activities and for the entity to introduce private sector partnerships. This will improve Transnet sustainability and support the implementation of the roadmap. Madam Speaker, I'm proud to announce that as part of this budget, we are introducing, introducing fundamental and far-reaching reforms to infrastructure financing and delivery. The reforms are to optimize the infrastructure value chain to be effective and efficient. In this way, we will strengthen the public investment management and the associated value chain. We will also attract private sector participation. In this regard, we gazetted amendments to the Triple P regulatory framework on public, uh, for public comments early this week, Minister Kubai. <clears throat> These amendments seek to reduce procedural complexity undertake, undertaking in, in, in undertaking Triple P's, creating capacity to support and manage Triple P's, formulate clear rules for managing unsolicited bids, and strengthening the governance of fiscal risk. We are reviewing institutional arrangements and governance for catalytic infrastructure. The intention is to create clearer mechanism for accountability, cooperation, and coordination. We are also consolidating similar functions to reduce duplication and inefficiencies. The intention is to fast-track delivery, particularly of blended finance arrangements. We are introducing several financing instruments, such as infrastructure bonds and concessional loans. As part of this, a flow-through tax vehicle for specific infrastructure projects similar to trust and other investment vehicles is being considered. 
a new funding window for proposal under the new dispensation of financing instruments will be open to the public, in, uh, to the public institution shortly. What, is, what does that mean, uh, those who know BFI? It's a new window of BFI. Through these reforms, greater efficiency gains and infrastructure delivery will be fast-tracked. This will benefit network sectors, social infrastructure, triple please, and blended finance projects. Madam Speaker, the National Treasury plays a crucial role in mobilizing resources, designing incentives, and influencing policy to mainstream climate, mainstream, uh, climate, finance, uh, climate change. As climate-related disasters intensify and multi-layer risk-based approach is being developed to manage the associated fiscal risk, this considers various funding instruments from grants to contingency funds, including climate change response fund, depending on the incidence and intensity of the disaster event. The National Treasury is reviewing disaster response grants to improve efficiency and create incentives for disaster planning, preparedness, and risk reduction. It is also developing a climate budget tracking framework to influence policy, planning, and budget decisions by tracking climate-related expenditure in public, in public budgets. The support of concessional funding providers such as multilateral development banks is going a long way to support our climate adaptation, mitigation and energy transition, and sustainability initiatives. Crowding in the private sector is necessary in, in, to manage the climate disaster funds. The government has raised 3.3 billion US dollars so far from multilateral development banks and international finance institutions to support climate change, energy, and just transition objectives. We are actively participating in climate negotiations, aligning with government advocacy for reforming multilateral finance institutions. We are also working with the eight municipalities to adapt and mitigate the effects of climate weather related events by providing technical assistance for climate responsive capital projects. The electric vehicle white paper outlines our strategy to transition towards a broader energy vehicle production and consumption in South Africa. Starting with electric vehicles, it aims to transition the automotive industry from primarily producing internal combustion engine vehicles to a dual platform that includes electric vehicles by 2035. To encourage the production of electric vehicles in South Africa, government will introduce an investment allowance for new investment, uh, investment beginning from the 1st of March 2026. This will allow producers to claim 150% of qualifying investment spending on electric and hydrogen-powered vehicles in the first year. The incentive will be implemented in addition to the existing support under the Automotive Production Development Program. Government has also reprioritized 964 million uh, over the medium term to support transition to electric vehicles. Honorable members, the public procurement bill was expeditiously passed by the National Assembly. The, the amended bill has now been referred to the National Council of, of Provinces for concurrence. National Treasury is supporting provincial legislators, legislators as, they, as they process the bill and conduct nationwide public hearings. The bill provides for transformation measures that through that truth set aside pre-qualification, advancement of persons disadvantaged by unfair discrimination. These measures will be applicable to specified categories of persons, including small enterprise owned by black people, black women, black youth, black people with disabilities, and enterprises with particular geographic area, including enforcement of transformation through the uh, BBBE level status. The bill also makes provision for local industrialization through designation and measures for sustainable development, labor absorption, and enterprise development, among others. We are well aware that currently procurement 
processes often fall short of delivering the cost-effective solution to government's needs. Too often, there's a substantial disparity between the prices government is paying, is being charged, and the prevailing market price. For instance, I'm told, the government buys, about, buys ICT hardware, such as laptops, uninterrupted power supply devices, monitors, and toners, at between 1.2 1 or 2 times more than market price. Given that government buys in large quantities, we should in fact be paying less and leveraging our buying power to get more value for our money. Obtaining value for money, <coughs> obtaining value for money as the principle of efficiency, transparency, and competition remain paramount. And we want to assure South Africans that these principles are not incompatible with transformation. Honourable members, the weak performance of our economy has resulted in sharp deterioration in tax revenue collection for 23-24. At 1.73 trillion, tax revenue for 23-24 is 56.1 billion lower than estimated in the 2023 budget. The shortfall is largely due to the decline in corporate profits and revenue for taxes on mining. Over the medium term, revenue projections are 45.6 billion higher than the 2023 medium term budget policy estimates which increased personal income tax and additional medium-term revenue proposals. This budget contains tax measures that will raise $15 billion in 2024-25 to alleviate immediate, immediate fiscal pressures and support faster debt stabilization. Revenue is mostly raised through personal income tax but not adjusting tax brackets, rebates, and medical tax credits for inflation. For alcohol products, excise duties above inflation increases of between 6.7 and 7.27 percent for 24-25 are proposed. This means a can of beer increases by 14 cents. A can of cider and alcohol fruit beverage goes by 14 cents. A bottle of wine costs an extra 20. Eight cents in terms of safe. A bottle of 45, uh, of 45 wine will cost an extra 47 cents. A bottle of sparkling wine will cost an extra 89 cents. Wait, a bottle of spirit, a bottle of spirits, including whiskey, but food. Gin and vodka increases by 5.53, 5 rand 53 cents. Salim Bangalamat. We are also proposing to no smetto BE are proposing. Whiskey is not a shayo BE, we are going to be a for it. We are also proposing increasing to bar, increase tobacco exercise duty by 4.7% for cigarettes and cigarettes tobacco and by 82% for pipe tobacco. This translates into 9 rand 51 cents increase for cigars. Yeah. 97 cents increase for to pack to, to a pack of cigarette and an extra 57 cents to for a pipe of tobacco. Ham Khailo Mukhane from Soweto, one of the over 2,700 South Africans who sent budget tips to the minister, has a suggestion I would like to share. Kamo says, I quote, I would suggest an introduction of a tax payment for hubbly bubbly as a cigarette and other alternatives. The, 
the country has seen an increase in a number of youth smoking this pro these products and parents are not pleased with this at all. Close quote. I would like to say to Kamu as a parent myself, I agree with you. I'm certain the Minister of Health also agrees. You will be happy to hear that they are, we are tabling an increase of the excess duty on electric, electronic nicotine and non-nicotine delivery systems known as vapes to three rand four cents per milliliter. On, on environmental taxes, the carbon tax increase from 159 to 199 rand per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent from the 1st of January 2024. The carbon fuel levy will increase, not the fuel levy, the carbon fuel levy will increase to 11 cents per liter of petrol and 14 cents per liter for diesel, effective from the 3rd of April. A discussion paper outlining proposal for the second phase of the carbon tax will be published for public comment later in the year. Madam Speaker, we are mindful of the already high cost of living, the impact and the impact fuel prices I have on the food and, and transport costs. In this regard, we are not proposing, we are proposing no increases to the general fuel levy for 24-25. This will result in a tax release of around four billion. This is money back in the pockets of consumers. Madam Speaker, progress has been made on the two-port retirement system since I last addressed the, the, you during the medium-term budget policy system. Contribution to re retirement funds will be split with one-third going into a savings component, two-thirds going into a retirement component. Now, the Funukwes tax alien to government will. From September, no So from the 1st of September 2012, uh, we must commend on Honorable uh, Maswanga. Uh, he has been vociferous in making sure that this bill passes. And we even fought on the timelines. It was difficult to persuade him because the industry was not ready. Uh, he wanted to be effective from the 1st of April, but the industry was not ready, but uh, he allowed us to postpone it to the 1st of September. Thank you, Com Comrade Maswangai. So, Gabula, the two-part system ensures that we strike a balance between preserving contributions to safeguard a better retirement for members while addressing the plight of the people to access some of their retirement funds to help ease their financial burden in times of distress. Over the next few years, we're also implementing a global minimum corporate tax to limit the negative effects of tax competition. Multinational corporations with an annual revenue ex exceeding 750 million euro okay 750 million euros will be subject to an effective tax rate of at least 15 percent regardless of where their profits are generated this is a global tax that's why even the benchmark is euros is an agreement in the OECD so we're beginning to implement that so irrespective of where your general your profits are generated, the proposed reform is expected to yield an, an additional eight billion in corporate tax revenue in 26-27. I encourage uh, interested parties to provide com provide comments on the draft global minimum tax bill published today. Our long-term tax policy strategy remain focused on broadening the tax base while improving tax compliance and administrative efficiency. 
visible progress has been made in rebuilding and modernizing SARS, the tax authority has expanded the tax register, improved debt collections, and reduced fraudulent refunds and trade valuation. This has led to improvements in revenue collection. To address the higher levels of illicit tobacco, SARS is deploying CCTV and related technologies at licensed tobacco manufacturers. Investigations and prosecutions have resulted in 10 billion in additional assessment, which, of which over 4 billion has been collected from the key players in the illicit gold and tobacco industry. These and other efforts have assisted with the improvement in revenue. Our bigger challenge, as I've stated earlier, is that our pie is not growing fast enough, and this limits our ability to generate sufficient revenues to distribute among our priority areas. Madam Speaker, the time, at the time of the 2023 medium term budget policy statement, when revenue collection had performed much worse than anticipated, Departments had to reprioritize spending and absorb the wage increases within their baseline. These measures were taken to protect our fiscal integrity. Equally, critical programs had to be protected. This is a practical expression of fiscal consolidation that supports delivery of core services and the social wage. Since then, since then, we have been able to reverse some or of the fiscal consolidation announced at the time of the medium-term budget policy statement. In this budget, I'm, I'm, tabling, I'm able to announce that the education sector is allocated an additional $25.7 billion for the carry-through cost of the wage increase over the medium term. At the same time, we are able to protect the budget of critical programs, such as school nutrition programs, the program to, that provides food to, to pupils in almost 20,000 schools. The Early Childhood Development Grant is allocated a fair of 1.6 billion, raising to 2 billion over the medium term. Health is allocated a total of 854 billion over the medium term. These allocations include 11.6 billion to address the 2023 wage agreement, 27 billion for infrastructure, 1.4 billion for the NHI grant over the same period. The allocation for the NHI is a demonstration of the government's commitment to this policy. There remain a range of system strengthening activities that are key enablers of an improved public health care system that must be undertaken. Such activities include building a national health information system and digital, and digital patients' records, upgrading health facilities and improving the quality of care to ensure that they meet the minimum criteria to be certified as accred and accredited for a contracting under NHI. Strengthening facilities and district management in preparation for contracting. Granting semi-autonomous status for central and, and potential other hospitals. And developing reference prices and provider payment methods for hospitals. Many of these activities are already underway, but require further development before the NHA can be rolled out at scale. Madam Speaker, there's also been significant process in, in improving access to public transport services for low-income communities. The rail recovery program of the passenger rail agents of South Africa is continuing with 27 corridors reopened by 20, December 2023. This will increase the number of passengers on metro rail from 15.6 million in 2022-23 to an estimated 48.6 million by 26-27. To ensure the effective discharge of office duties during elections and its other responsibility beyond the polls, the Independent Electoral Commission is allocated uh, 2.3 billion. The police and the defense purely for the elections. The police and the defense purely for the elections are allocated an additional 350 million to support the elections. 
A further 200 million will be allocated for political party funding as political parties prepare for the general elections. Government also supports resettled farmers through land redistribution and tenure reform programs, which have been allocated 6 billion over the medium term. To keep pace with inflation and increase, uh, increase access, perm perm permanent social grants are increased. Let me just pause and say, when the Abang Abe could relate to the two one women, my talkers and a woman, a linear in the compound, a walking stick. But you are not going to go and announce new sell and get 20 rand. So I want to assure Lakok, Ogut, Mna, the generals, and the new sell and 20 rand. We are giving them an increase of 100 rand to the old age grant. Water, but over the disability care and grants. This will be split in 90 rand effective from April and 10 effective from October. 50 rand increase for the foster care and 20 rand increase to the child support grant. Order. We are Order, sensitive members. to Order. the increase in the cost of living for nearly 19 million South Africans who are really rely on these grants to make ends meet. In this regard, we have done as much as the fiscal envelope allows. Work is currently underway to improve the COVID-19 social relief uh, of distress grant. By April the 1st, like all other grants, these grants are starting on the 1st of April. As the President has said, that is going to be improved. Work is being done. The Minister of, of Social Development is publishing regulations. When we finally gather those regulations, the new grant will, and the figure will be published together with those regulations. <laughs> these improvements will be within the fiscal framework. Uh, for the extension of the grant beyond 2025, the we have made the point that it may work. have to find some revenue source for it. Pack. <laughs> we have also made provision for key initiatives aimed at job creation. 61.4 billion is allocated for employment program over the medium term. 7.4 billion has been identified for the presidential employment initiative. Government is also prioritizing fighting crime and corruption with a focus on enhancing law enforcement agency. Mamel, housing we are doing all. If facts is on the table, we are doing the work. We are doing the work. As more shall deliver. That total of 765 billion rand is allocated with peace and security cluster. In the coming financial year, in the coming financial year, 10,000 new police recruits will be trained. And as part of the country's responsibility to promote regional peace and stability, this budget will also allocate funding for the deployment of soldiers in Mozambique and DRC. Work on costing and identifying these needs for these critical missions will continue throughout the year and funding will be allocated as such. 628 million has been allocated to the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development for the implementation of FATF and State Capture Commission recommendations, bringing the total funding to these efforts to 2.3 billion. Government is, is using 2.9 billion from the criminal asset recovery account to combat illegal mining and other priority crimes with a 60% allocated and in fact 1.7 billion allocated for the deployment of the police including vehicle procurement. This budget is also prioritizing infrastructure provision. Government plans to invest more than 943 billion rand in public infrastructures. and maintaining existing assets, the building of new infrastructure, 
Madam Speaker, 2.8 trillion, or put it differently, 5.1 percent of down interest expenditure is expended to provinces and municipalities over the next three years. 5.7 is allocated to local government and 2.2 trillion. Billion is allocated to provinces for the next three years to cover the cost of implementing the 2023 public service wage agreement, mainly in education and health sector. <laughs> Provision of these additional funds will cushion the wage bill pressure faced by these critical uh, personnel intensive departments while freeing up resources for capital investment and goods and services. Moreover, reductions that were previously made on some of the grants have been reversed. Restoring baseline of these grants will help maintain important service for the most vulnerable and provide for critical capital investment. However, to ensure public finances remain sustainable, the grants are maintained to several other grants baseline, although many continue to grow over the next three years despite the reductions. Regarding municipalities, an additional 1.4 billion is provided for municipal disaster recovery grant to fund the repair and reconstruction of infrastructure damage by the tra tragic floods of 2023. <laughs> Madam Speaker, municipalities are the call face of service delivery. Sadly, an unacceptable number of them are experiencing weaknesses in governance, financial management, and service delivery. To address these challenges and to transform municipalities into engines of growth, we have adopted a multi-pronged approach. It focuses on tightening budget processes, ramping up oversight, increasing the skills and capacity of municipal employees, and driving investment in maintaining and building infrastructure. Madam Speaker, this country, this year the country host the annual meetings of the new development bank, which will happen for the second, for the second time since the formation of the BRICS Bank. In 2025, South Africa takes on the presidency of the G20, following that of Brazil and India. Before that, South Africa's G20 president is in an opportunity for us to advance the most pressing economic and development and financial issues that face poor and developing countries. As President Ramaphosa rightly stated in his State of the Nation address, our goal is to place Africa's development at the top of the agenda where the whole, when we host the G20 in 25. We are working on the necessary allocations and identification of funds to make sure that the various events are a success. As we have shown recently, South Africa remains an important regional and international leader. Through participation and, and advocacy on platforms such as G20, we can push for substantive reform of multinational institutions like the World Bank and IMF so that developing countries participate more equally in the decision-making process and global governance. Moral courage and know-how are not in short supply in our country. We should harness these gifts not only to better ourselves and our economy, but for the benefit of the entire continent. Madam Speaker, we've come a long way in the last 30 years, 30 years ahead of us, and whatever the challenges and opportunities they may bring are something we should look forward to. Given our difficult past and some of the inevitable challenges we have faced as a young democracy trying to find its place in a world marked by a number of new and overlapping crises, it would be easy to indulge in extremes either of blind optimism or crippling pessimism. We should resist both these extremes. Rather, we should heed the words of our first democratic president, Nelson Mandela, who more than him saw the pursuit of social economic justice and, sh and shared prosperity as a journey rather than a destination. Allow me to repeat what the president said in his closing remarks. I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I've made missteps along the way, but I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, the only, the only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I've taken a moment to rest and to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me. Took, took, uh, to look at back to the distance I have come, but I can only rest for a moment 
for with freedom come responsibility. I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. In the land, in the land. Madam Speaker, as I conclude, I want to remind South Africans that the message today should take away from this budget. Government is making the most out of its way to lim with limited resources. We continue to support economic growth, reduce gro growth of, of government debt and the cost of debt, allocate more funds for core services, and provide the social wage. I'm grateful to the President and Deputy President for their continued support and leadership. <laughs> Thank you to the Deputy Minister of Finance, Dr. Masono, and the excellent National Treasury team, led by Director General Dr. Duncan Peterson, the majority of whom, Mr. President, are Tinsalos. Thank you to the Commission of the South African Revenue Services and the Governor of the South African Revenue Bank. Thank you to my colleagues the ministers in the committee of the main combat and in the budget council who shared the heavy load of the tough decision that may mean to sustain the public finances. To parliamentary comment, my chairperson, Honorable Maswangani, Honorable Utelezi. Of course, and to my wife and family, your love support and forbearance are daily inspiration. Lastly, thank you to you, each and every one of South Africans, and those who have been sending messages encouraging.